Gravitas, co-presented by Skoda Superb, best in next class. Co-powered by Star Health Insurance, the health insurance specialist. While the entire world suffers because of the Wuhan virus, China is busy manufacturing lies. Its latest product is a misinformation campaign trying to portray India as the birthplace of this virus. What's worse, this lie involves monkeys and heat waves. The claim is as bizarre as it gets. China's factory of lies has outdone itself. On Gravitas tonight, we tell you how this is not the only campaign China has started against India, how it also wants to target India's water security, and why China's promises of peace are proving to be mere lip service. We also have for you a long list of China's mounting financial woes, which tell us how China absolutely cannot afford to provoke its neighbor and why the incoming Biden administration in America might have a lot to do with this campaign of provocation. I am Molly Gambhir, also on the show for you tonight. Australia, China's war of words intensifies. Bilateral ties have hit a new low after China claims to show an Australian soldier targeting an Afghan child. Australia lashes out at China, demands an apology. Iran vows revenge for the killing of its top nuclear scientist. Nigeria Boko Haram attack kills 110. Ethiopia's Tigray crisis is far from over. A Gravitas special report on the multiple crises haunting this region. Japan's suicide crisis has worsened the stigma around mental health continues to plague the country. We do some number crunching. We also get you a detailed report on Diego Maradona's inheritance battle. But first, as always, Gravitas Global Headlines. The British government bans telecommunication firms from installing Huawei 5G kits after September 2021. The move is aimed at purging Huawei's equipment from high-speed mobile networks. Britain has ordered all Huawei equipment to be removed by the end of 2027. The Tigray People's Liberation Front say they have captured key towns and cities back from the Ethiopian military. Its military spokesperson goes on to say that TPLF forces also managed to shoot down a fighter jet belonging to Ethiopia. Four French police officers charged in connection with the beating of a black man in Paris with two held in custody. Three of the police officers charged for willful violence by a person holding public authority and forgery. Inmates staged a riot at a high-security prison in Sri Lanka over a surge of coronavirus infections. At least eight died and 55 wounded as police sought to end the unrest. Sri Lankan authorities are now saying that the situation is under control. A New Zealand watchdog has filed charges against 13 parties over the death of 22 people during a volcanic eruption on the White Island last year. As per WorkSafe, its year-long inquiry found that 10 organizations and 3 individuals had failed to meet their health and safety obligations by taking tourists to the active volcano. Hong Kong reimposes social distancing measures in the city. As authorities battle a fourth wave of infections, daily cases have risen above 100 in recent days, prompting authorities to usher in stricter measures similar to those seen during earlier outbreaks. 
Massive bushfires burn through Australia's Fraser Island amid a growing heatwave. Sydney, Australia's largest city, suffered through the weekend as it recorded its hottest November night with temperatures peaking above 40 degrees Celsius. A volcano in Indonesia's East Nusa Tenggara province erupts, spewing ash and smoke as high as 4 kilometers into the sky and forcing more than 2,700 residents to seek refuge. Formula One will conduct a thorough investigation into the Romain Grosjean's horror crash at the Bahrain GP on Sunday. The Haas driver's car hit the barriers, broke into two and caught fire instantly in scenes not witnessed in the sport in nearly 30 years. Grosjean was pulled to safety by medical officials and escaped with only minor injuries. But managing director of motorsport Ross Braun, who will lead the investigation, has admitted that the crash has still thrown up several troubling questions. Australian opener David Warner has been ruled out of the final ODI and the T20i series that follows against India due to a groin injury. Warner picked up the injury while fielding the second ODI in Sydney on Sunday and is expected to be out for four to six weeks, leaving him in a race against time to be fit for the test series that starts on December 17th in Adelaide. It's been more than six months. China attempted an intrusion into India, attacked Indian soldiers unprovoked. Eight rounds of talks have happened since that standoff began, and Beijing's promise of peace has proved to be just lip service. As India and China get up for the ninth round of military talks, the dragon is provoking India once again. With misinformation campaigns, and a dam project that could impact India's water security. On Gravitas tonight, we tell you all about China's latest provocations. Let me first tell you about an unbelievable claim. Three Chinese scientists claim the Wuhan virus came from India. Even we could not believe this when we first heard about this report. Then we saw the report. It is 22 pages long. This is perhaps the most brazen attempt by China to muddy the waters, raise suspicion just to deflect the global criticism that has come its way. This so-called scientific study has appeared on a website called SSRN.com. This is a pre-print platform of the medical journal The Lancet. What is a pre-print? Quite simply, it is a full draft of a research paper that is widely shared publicly before it is peer-reviewed. Let me emphasize here, this is a draft research paper. It hasn't been vetted by the scientific community in any form. It has not been published by any journal. Anyone can submit research papers to pre-print platforms to share it with the larger scientific community. But China has made a mockery of this privilege. This study makes some absolutely preposterous claims. It says the Wuhan virus appeared in India before traveling to Wuhan. What are the Chinese basing this claim on? Heat waves and monkeys, as bizarre as that sounds. Allow me to quote now. From May to June 2019, the second longest recorded heat wave had rampaged northern central India and Pakistan, which created a serious water crisis in this region. They cite Wikipedia as their source for this information. And then there is more. I'm quoting again. The water shortage made wild animals like monkeys engage in the deadly fight over water among each other and would have surely increased the chance of human wild animal interactions. Can you believe this? Well, no one can. Not even the scientific community, which is calling this paper biased and very flawed. This paper has no facts, no scientific basis. It is just an attempt to whip up a wild conspiracy theory, one which Chinese state-owned media outlets like the Global Times are now featuring on their website. It seems like the scientific community has rejected these falsehoods masquerading as research. Before we went on air, we found out that this report was no longer available on its link. 
when it is so clear that this paper is unscientific, why did China attempt such a stunt? Because it wants to sow doubts and challenge the established facts and evade blame for unleashing a pandemic. There is no doubt this pandemic began in Wuhan, but China has floated many conspiracy theories to create a smokescreen. First, it said the virus came with the US Army to Wuhan. Then the Chinese have blamed Italy for the outbreak while trying to take over the WHO investigation into the origins of the Wuhan virus. India should see this as a clear attempt by China to hurt India's international credibility as a reliable partner on matters of public health. This is information warfare, and it is not the only provocation. If reports are to be believed, China now wants to build a dam on the Brahmaputra River. Chinese authorities have given the go-ahead to a hydropower company. The plan is to build a downstream dam on the lower reaches of this river. The Brahmaputra River originates from Tibet and flows into India, then Bangladesh. In the past, New Delhi has raised concerns over such infrastructure projects because they pose a threat to India's water security. Because with such dams, China could control how waters of the Brahmaputra flow into India. Potentially, the flow of water can be blocked or diverted with such dams. Construction on the river can pollute it. China also has access to valuable data that can help in managing floods and fluctuations on India's side, which is why India cannot afford to ignore China's moves on the Brahmaputra. So China provoked India militarily. It tried to intrude into Indian territory. It has launched a misinformation campaign to spin the truth about the origins of the Wuhan virus. And now it wants to build dams to control water supplies. What is driving China's behavior? Has the incoming Biden administration and its promise to work with India against China rattled Beijing? Our next report tries to find the answers. It is rare for America to witness any form of cross-party support. But the Democrats and Republicans seem to agree on one thing. They believe China under Xi Jinping presents a threat to global security. Beijing knows this, which is why it has been cautious in dealing with the incoming president, Joe Biden. Xi Jinping waited for weeks before sending his congratulations. The message failed to warm America's heart. The battle lines are drawn. The Biden administration is making plans to contain China. And it wants India's help. Joe Biden's candidate to replace Mike Pompeo is Anthony Blinken. He wants India to be a key American partner in dealing with China from a position of strength. While speaking to Indian Americans earlier this year, Blinken said, and I quote, India and America have a common challenge, which is to deal with an increasingly assertive China across the board, including its aggression towards India at the line of actual control, but also using its economic might to coerce others. That statement does not come as a surprise. It is a reflection of the hard line that Biden has taken against the dragon. The president-elect during his campaign called Xi Jinping a thug and backed India over China in the ongoing border standoff. I said if the United States and India became closer friends and partners, then the world will be a safer place. <clears throat> if elected president, I'll continue to believe it and continue what I've long called for, including standing with India and confronting the threats it faces in its own region and along its borders. Considering this, the Chinese state media is warning that relations may not improve under Joe Biden. Last week, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs adopted a cautious tone, calling for no conflict or confrontation with America. 
China is willing to uphold the spirit of non-conflict, non-confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation with the United States. Strengthen communication, focus on cooperation, control differences, and promote the healthy and stable development of Sino-U.S. relations. The tensions at the border haven't eased, with Beijing doubling down on its aggression. India and the United States are expected to mount a strong anti-China front and take the dragon head on. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. China is trying to provoke India. China wants to take on Australia. China is in a trade war with the United States and China is fighting six countries in the South China Sea. But can China afford all this aggression? In other words, does Beijing have the money to run this campaign of provocation? In a single word, the answer is no. And tonight I come to you with some numbers that expose China's vulnerabilities. It's financial stress. It's debt. I also tell you why the situation is unlikely to improve anytime soon. You see, the Chinese economy is in a state of crisis. Corporate debt defaults are set to exceed 100 billion yuan for a third consecutive year. According to a report, in the last two weeks, China has seen a surge in missed repayments. Onshore delinquencies have touched 104 billion yuan, or $15.8 billion. And offshore delinquencies are pegged at $8.1 billion. What is to be blamed for this? China's flawed policies. Beijing exported the Wuhan virus. It hit the global supply chain, China pulled the world into recession, hit businesses the world over and created a mess of the global economy. But Beijing wanted to ensure that Chinese businesses tied through this crisis and maybe profiteer from it. So what China did is that it opened up its credit taps now 11 months into the pandemic. Lenders want their money back. But businesses do not have the resources to repay. Hence, these defaults. I have two questions now. First, Chinese companies are defaulting on repayments at such a huge scale. Corporate debt is exceeding 100 billion yuan for the third straight year. How then is China claiming that everything is business as usual? It was just last month that China said its economy is back on track with a 4.9% growth in quarter three. Question number two, what do these numbers say about the situation in China? They say, never trust numbers coming out of China. For all you know, the real situation could be worse. Chinese companies are missing payments for a variety of reasons, but topping the chart is bankruptcy. At least 43.8 billion yuan could not come in because seven companies filed bankruptcy restructuring applications. And this includes the Peking University founder group, Technology is the worst hit industry here, which has accounted for more than a third of the average default. So it comes down to this. China is under a lot of financial stress and it should not be trying to provoke its neighbor because it cannot afford to do so. Here's something else. China's financial situation is unlikely to improve anytime soon. Have a look at the headlines. They spell disaster for Chinese trade and businesses. Reuters is reporting that the United States will be adding at least four more Chinese companies to its defense blacklist, taking the total number of blacklisted companies to 35. Joining that list is China's top chip maker, SMIC, or Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corp. China's national offshore oil and gas producer, CNOOC, will be blacklisted as well. The U.S. claims that these companies are owned or controlled by the Chinese military. And there is more. The U.K. has asked all telecom providers to stop installing Huawei equipment in 5G networks starting September next year. They have also been told to rip out all Huawei equipment from 5G networks by 2027. Huawei, remember, was once China's blue-eyed boy. It was supposed to be Beijing's stairway to global tech dominance. Today, Chinese tech companies are being shunned globally. They are defaulting on payments at home. 
Shouldn't Beijing be indulging in serious policy rethinking for saving its businesses and overcoming the financial stress instead of staring at the other side of the border? But we know China is not a fan of addressing real problems. For example, it does not like talking about dictatorship or the source of the Wuhan virus or how the Chinese economy is suffering. Instead of addressing these problems at home, China has picked up another fight with one of its key trading partners, Australia. Our next report tells you all about this latest war of words. China is at it yet again. Beijing is trying to misuse another crisis for its propaganda. On the 30th of November, the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Li Jianzhao posted this photo on Twitter. It claimed to show an Australian soldier killing an Afghan child. We had to blur the image because it was very gory. The Chinese spokesperson declared he was shocked by quote-unquote the murder of Afghan civilians and prisoners by Australian soldiers. Australia rubbished Chinese claims as disinformation. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison said China should be ashamed of itself. It is utterly outrageous and it cannot be justified on any basis whatsoever. The Chinese government should be totally ashamed of this post. It, dis it diminishes them in the world's eyes. Morrison called the image repugnant, adding that it created a falsified image of an Australian soldier. The war of words comes on the heels of a war crimes inquiry that accused the Australian elite forces of unlawfully killing 39 people during the Afghan war. The report claims at least 25 Australian personnel had taken part in unlawful killing and that 36 such incidents needs to be investigated by federal police. Scott Morrison had said that the report contained difficult and hard news for Australians. And now, in what are being called his most stern words yet, the Prime Minister is slamming China for playing up the crisis for propaganda. There are undoubtedly tensions that exist between China and Australia. But this is not how you deal with them. Australia is seeking an apology from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from the Chinese government for this outrageous post. We are also seeking its removal immediately and have also contacted Twitter to take it down immediately. It is a false image and a, a terrible slur on our great defence forces and the men and women who have served in that uniform for over 100 years. How has China reacted to Morrison's demand for an apology? Australian soldiers committed such appalling crimes. Shouldn't the Australian government feel ashamed? With this, the bilateral ties between Australia and China have hit a new low. It all began when Canberra called for an international inquiry into the origins of the Wuhan virus. Like we said, China is not a fan of addressing real problems. Bureau Report, we own. World is one. On to a country at war with itself, Pakistan. The tussle between Pakistan's opposition and the Imran Khan government is showing no signs of ending. After a major show of strength in Peshawar on Sunday, opposition parties held another massive rally in Multan. This was the fifth such demonstration held by the Pakistan Democratic Movement. Who all were in attendance? Bolana Fazul Rahman, the chief of Jamaat Ulema e Islam, Asifa Bhutto Zardari, the sister of Bilawal Bhutto and a member of Pakistan People's Party. The showstopper was Maryam Nawaz, the vice president of Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz. Speaking in Multan, Maryam Nawaz called out the Pakistan government's backdoor efforts to stop the rally from taking place. <laughs>
Remember, Pakistan's Punjab government and the local administration in Multan had denied permission to the opposition for this rally. The reason cited was the second wave of the Wuhan virus. The authorities in Multan blocked most routes to Kila Kona Kasim Bagh Stadium, where the demonstration was scheduled to take place. They took control of the stadium, removed tents and chairs, and detained several opposition leaders. Among those detained was Kasim Gilani, a prominent opposition leader and the son of Pakistan's former Prime Minister Yusuf Raza Gilani. The Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, put out a series of self-righteous tweets justifying this crackdown. Allow me to quote a few of them. Problem confronting us in Pakistan during COVID-19 is of a political leadership that has never gone through any democratic struggle nor worked with ordinary citizens to understand the problems they confront. These entitled leaders living like royalty in their secluded mansions have simply inherited their positions because of their families. There's more. I'm quoting further. Their shahi lifestyles are directly dependent on saving their families ill-gotten, illegally acquired wealth through robbing and impoverishing the nation. Speaking in Multan, political debutant Asifa Bhutto Zardari slammed Imran Khan's crackdown. The 27-year-old said if the men from their parties are arrested, the women will take to the streets by the thousands. I leave you with this. In January this year, Iran's formidable Major General Qasem Soleimani was assassinated in a targeted U.S. drone strike in Baghdad. In November, Iran's topmost nuclear scientist Mohsin Fakhrizadeh has been assassinated. This time, the killing has taken place on Iranian soil. Fakhrizadeh was killed in an ambush near the capital Tehran. No one has claimed responsibility. The U.S. government and Israel have both denied to make any comment, but Iran is preparing for a retaliation nonetheless. It has vowed revenge. Our next report tells you more. Iran is in a state of grief. Iranians are mourning the death of their top nuclear scientist. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Mohsin Fakhrizadeh, a member of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, Fakhrizadeh was a leading figure in Iran's nuclear program. He was instrumental in drawing up plans for Iran's first uranium enrichment plant. But he balanced his high status with a low public profile. For many Iranians mourning his death, Fakhrizadeh was just a university professor. He has now been declared a martyr. A state funeral was held in Tehran and it was attended by Iranians from all walks of life. On the 27th of November, Fakhrizadeh was assassinated in an ambush near Tehran. Reports say he was shot three times by a remote-controlled machine gun. The gunfire lasted for three minutes, after which a Nissan laden with explosives was set off in close proximity. 
The killing in broad daylight on Iranian soil has sent shockwaves across the country. The Iranian state media says weapons used in the killing were made in Israel, and the Iranian leadership has also blamed Israel for the assassination. Iran's President Hassan Rouhani has vowed revenge. Iran's enemies should know that the people of Iran and officials are braver than to leave this criminal act unanswered. In due time, they will answer for this crime. There is also anger on the streets. Hundreds of young Iranian students are protesting across the country. They are burning American and Israeli flags. They are calling upon their leaders to retaliate at the earliest. The government, the parliament and the Supreme National Security Council must suspend the additional protocol and all IAEA inspectors who are in fact Zionist inspectors and must be expelled. There has been no word on the killing from Israel. But a 2018 presentation by the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has resurfaced. And it is adding fuel to the allegations that Fakhrizadeh had been on Israel's target list for a long time. This is how Dr. Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, head of Project Ahmad, put it. Remember that name, Fakhrizadeh. So here's his directive. It's right here. And he says, the general aim is to announce the closure of Project Ahmad, but then he adds, special activities, you know what that is, special activities will be carried out under the title of scientific know-how developments. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the White House, the Pentagon, the U.S. State Department and the CIA have all declined to comment on the killing. So has U.S. President-elect Joe Biden's transition team. The killing could escalate tensions between Iran and the United States in the final weeks of Donald Trump's presidency. I think Iran is a, in a situation whereby uh, assumes any reaction or response to this assassination inevitable. Because if it uh, doesn't respond, it will make the other side to advance further. And that will encourage them to do uh, further assassinations or actions against Iran. First, Qasem Soleimani, now Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. Iran has lost two of its topmost officials in targeted attacks. The implications could be severe. West Asia is bracing itself for some turbulent times. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Staying on with West Asia, senior White House advisor Jared Kushner will be traveling to the region later this week. He is slated to visit Saudi Arabia and Qatar along with American envoys. According to reports, Kushner will be meeting the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in Neom. He is also expected to meet the Emir of Qatar, Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani. In the second leg of that tour, America's West Asia envoys Avi Barkowitz, Brian Hook and Adam Boiler will accompany Kushner during this visit. What's on the agenda? The further normalization of ties between Israel and the Gulf countries. The issue has been a key focus of the Trump White House. So far, Kushner and his team have managed to normalize Israel's ties with the UAE, Bahrain and Sudan. But Saudi Arabia remains the elusive prize. And that's where things get interesting. You see, King Salman of Saudi Arabia has been a firm supporter of the Palestinian cause. He has ruled out ties with Israel unless Palestine is given statehood. The Saudi Crown Prince, however, appears to be more favorable. Recently, Israel's Prime Minister is said to have traveled to Saudi Arabia and met with the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Netanyahu and MBS were reportedly joined by the U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Riyadh denied that the meeting took place. When Netanyahu was asked about it, he said that he hoped the circle will expand. Remember, Kushner's visit also comes at a tense time in West Asia. We just told you how the region is on the edge after the killing of Mohsin Fakhrizadeh. Common opposition to Iran has been the thread that has held the U.S.-led regional alliance intact. But now with Joe Biden set to be sworn in as America's next president, both Saudi Arabia and Israel fear that America might soften its stance on Iran. 
Joe Biden has expressed his intention to rejoin the nuclear treaty, something that both countries feel is detrimental to their cause. To cut the long story short, normalizing ties between Israel and Saudi Arabia will be a crowning moment for Donald Trump, a major diplomatic victory right before he leaves office. And Jared Kushner's visit is by all means aimed at achieving just that. This is a very hopeful time and I believe that so much peace and prosperity is possible in this region and throughout the world. On the vaccine tracker tonight, we tell you about a controversy that has hit India's biggest vaccine maker. The Serum Institute of India, the same company that is supposed to supply the Oxford vaccine, a volunteer claiming to be a part of the company's trials has levied a serious allegation. A 40-year-old Chennai-based business consultant has alleged serious side effects from the vaccine. He claims that he suffered a neurological breakdown and impairment of cognitive functions. The volunteer served a legal notice to the company seeking 5 crore rupees as compensation. How has the company been responding to this charge? With a potential lawsuit rejecting the charges of the volunteer. The Serum Institute said it will seek damages in excess of 100 crore rupees. The company says these charges are malicious. The Serum Institute says the volunteer is falsely laying the blame for his medical problems on the trials. An investigation is now underway. Reportedly, the Drugs Controller General of India is now probing if there was an adverse event after this volunteer was given the shot. The Oxford vaccine has been one of the most promising vaccine candidates. Over the weekend, Prime Minister Modi visited the Serum Institute for a survey. It was one of the three faculties that the Indian Prime Minister paid a visit to, one of the three facilities. The developing world has placed its hopes on the Oxford vaccine for three reasons. Number one, the cost. The makers of the Oxford vaccine plan to distribute the shot at cost price. That could be around three to four dollars per dose. In comparison, the shots from Pfizer and Moderna are much higher. Reportedly, Pfizer is charging $20 per shot for its vaccine, while Moderna could price it at $32 to $37 per dose. Just today, Moderna has moved for approvals. Its vaccine is set to be 94% effective. The company also claims that the shot has 100% efficacy against more severe cases of the Wuhan virus. Back to the Oxford vaccine now. The second reason why the developing world wants this shot, the availability of supplies. Already the developing countries have been promised more than 1 billion doses. And number three, storage. The Oxford vaccine can be stored at standard refrigeration levels for six months. That is between 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. The makers expect the demand to be high. This vaccine is likely to be used very widely because it can be made in very large amounts. It's not going to be a high price and it can be stored in a fridge, it doesn't need a freezer. And most vaccines that we use in the world today are stored in fridges and the distribution networks work on having a vaccine that needs two to eight degree storage, not frozen storage. So that makes it cheaper and easier to deliver. We can make lots of it, or AstraZeneca can make lots of it. I, it's not me, our group making it, it's AstraZeneca are going to make it, but they can make a lot and they've been planning to make a lot and the price will be relatively low. So it's going to be affordable for lots of countries. So all of that means that it's a very deployable vaccine and we need a lot of people to be vaccinated. So it all really comes down to safety. If the vaccine is safe enough to be given to everyone. We don't know yet. The vaccine needs to pass the trials before it can be administered to the people. The Oxford trial recently ran into a controversy when the researchers at Oxford made their trial results public. They said the vaccine was 62% effective, but they also said that a smaller subset of volunteers were given a lower dose of the vaccine by mistake. Bizarrely, the lower dose led to a higher efficacy rate of around 90%. 
Regulators around the world will now have to assess the data that they receive from these trials before they are given emergency authorization for use. As far as the situation in India is concerned, the trial still continues. The authorities are still looking into the complaints of the volunteer. We will be keeping a close eye on these developments. On to Africa now. In Nigeria, the Boko Haram has slaughtered 110 farmers. The brutal killings have thrust into limelight the many conflicts and power tussles that continue to plague Africa to this day. In Ethiopia, the government has discovered mass graves in the Tigray region. In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa is set to face a vote of confidence in the country's parliament. And in sub-Saharan Africa, the death toll due to malaria has outpaced that of COVID-19. Our next report takes you through all these developments to give you a sense of the multiple crises plaguing Africa. <laughs> In the village of Zabarmari in northeast Nigeria, there's a sense of anguish and helplessness among the residents. 110 farmers in the village have been brutally slaughtered. They were tied up, tortured and then beheaded. So far, no group has claimed responsibility. But the barbaric killings are being called the handiwork of the Boko Haram. A jihadist terror outfit that has flourished in Nigeria for nearly two decades. Boko Haram has killed many of us. 32 people have been slaughtered. We need assistance. We need some weapons and armed men because we have youth who can volunteer to guard our farmers while working on the farm. Please do this for God's sake. As the bodies of the slain villagers were laid to rest, the farmers called upon the federal government to recruit more soldiers. They say they face a desperate choice to stay home and die of starvation or get killed by insurgents. Dozens of farmers are still missing. Reports say the death toll could rise further. Since emerging in 2002, the Boko Haram insurgency in Nigeria has developed into one of the world's most brutal conflicts. At least 36,000 people have been killed and more than 2 million displaced. Self-educated preacher Muhammad Yusuf founded the group in the northeastern Borno state. He called upon Muslims to reject the state and regard Western science and modern literature as sinful. The conflict he started remains concentrated in the northeast. Most of Nigeria's Muslims live in the north, while Christians live mostly in the south. The Nigerian government based in Abuja is often accused of doing little to stop the insurgency. But this time the country's president, Muhammadu Buhari, has vowed to bring the perpetrators to book. As Nigeria battles Islamic insurgency, nearly 5,000 kilometers away in Ethiopia, the situation is no better. The Tigray conflict in Ethiopia is showing no signs of ending. At least 70 graves have been discovered in the Humera town of the Tigray region. This discovery was made just a day after the Ethiopian government claimed that the region was back under its control. As the armed conflicts continue during the pandemic, the death toll due to malaria has outpaced COVID-19 in sub-Saharan Africa. According to the World Health Organization, there were an excess of 20,000 to 1 lakh malaria deaths in sub-Saharan Africa last year. Most of the victims included babies in the poorest parts of Africa. Meanwhile, political turmoil is plaguing the more developed regions of Africa. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa will be facing his first motion of confidence this Thursday. South Africa's opposition party, the African Transformation Movement, has listed 15 reasons why Ramaphosa should be removed from office. Mass murders, military conflicts, deadly diseases, and political unrest. This is a very difficult period for the continent of Africa. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. 
While the world is struggling to contain the Wuhan virus, Japan is fighting an enemy that is deadlier. In the country, suicide has killed more people in October than the Wuhan virus in the same month or the entire year combined. Why are so many people being driven to suicide in Japan? Who is at fault here? And what is the government doing about it? Here's a detailed report. Japan is fighting an enemy deadlier than the Wuhan virus. Suicide claimed more lives in October than the Wuhan virus did through the year. In October 2020, 2,153 people died of suicide in Japan. The country's current Wuhan virus toll is 2,106. Compare the numbers and consider two critical facts. Number one, Japan never had a full-scale Wuhan virus lockdown. Number two, Japan has been comparatively less impacted by the virus. While the pandemic may be a catalyst, it has not been the trigger for suicides in Japan. The country has one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Several factors are responsible. The stigma around mental health issues, financial stress, isolation caused by technology, social withdrawal, what Japan calls hikikomori and a history of honorable suicides, or seppuku. As of 2016, Japan has a suicide mortality rate of 18.5 per 100,000 people. Japan's suicide rate is almost double the annual global average of 10.6 per 100,000 people. These numbers are from the World Health Organization. There's more. Japan is the only G7 country where suicide is the leading cause of death of young people, or people aged 15 to 39. Suicide is also the leading manner of death for men aged 20 to 44. In 2019, 19,959 people died by suicide in Japan. This number was a cause for celebration. Local media reported that it was the first time since 1978 that the total number of suicides did not cross 20,000. But the Wuhan virus may have reversed this trend. Suicides are on the rise and women and children have been hit the hardest. In October, suicides among women increased nearly 83%. A lot of women work part-time in Japan's hospitality industry and many of them have been laid off because of the pandemic. Mothers are also worried about the well-being of their children who are mostly attending classes from home. A survey of over 8,700 Japanese parents and children found that 75% of Japan's school-going children are showing signs of stress because of the pandemic. A series of recent celebrity suicides have not helped the cause. As Japan prepares for a third wave of the Wuhan virus, the biggest challenge will be to fight the virus of stigma attached to mental health. Bureau Report, we on World is One. With that, it's a wrap on this evening's edition of Gravitas, leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.